All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final lecture of the course. Last one today, and we're going to talk about, of course, ray tracing. We're going to finish up what we started last time. Um, so let's just quickly go, or let's just go through the part that uh, we talked about last time, because uh, afterwards someone came to me and said I was rushing a little bit too fast through it, it uh, if I could be a little slower next time. Um, of course I can, um, but it makes more sense to tell me that at the beginning or during the lecture and not afterwards. Um, of course, it also makes no sense to say that in the last lecture, but I know I said that at the very beginning when I said that, of course, one of the problems with this course is that there are a lot of people with a lot of experience and often you see it also in the evaluations that people say, yeah, he's going into all the details and he should be much faster with it. And then there are, of course, always people who say, well, this is way too much and way too fast for me. Um, so, yeah, whenever I'm too fast or too slow, raise your hand or make yourself noticed. Good. So, um, yeah, so just a quick recap from last time. The reason why I was speeding so much through it last time is, of course, that uh, everything that we did last time when we talked about the basics of ray tracing was material or stuff that we could already do. There was not really much or almost nothing really new that we learned last time in terms of the basic mathematic tools that we needed to do it. But it was only new or the things we only had to take care of were the ones where uh, how we apply those tools to this particular case and uh, use it. So for example, when we started with the mathematical basics, we talked about three different ways to represent a line. We talked about the parametric equation, the implicit equation, and the slope intercept uh, representation. And uh, then when we talked about ray tracing, of course, the obvious way to represent a ray is a line. And the obvious way to do it is, of course, to use the parametric equation because then we can represent, we can use the i vector, which is the position from where we are shooting our ray, where we have then our virtual camera. We can use this i vector e as a support vector, uh, yeah, as a support vector. And then we use a pixel on the screen minus this support vector as the direction vector. And that way we have a ray that points directly towards that screen. And if then for the t value we set t equals zero, we get the i vector. For t equals one, we get the vector that is pointing directly onto the screen. And for all values larger than one, we can then get the ray that shoots into the scene. And then we can specify the first object that intersects with this ray. And this intersection was also something that I did rather quickly because the intersection uh, was something we discussed at the, one of the very first lectures. The only thing that was new then, and that was actually quite a nice thing, uh, because it really combined a lot of the basic stuff that we did at the beginning, was the intersection with triangles. And we already did, of course, intersection with triangles at the beginning. I hope you remember. Uh, in the first part, we talked about how to calculate the intersection of a line with a triangle. We said we can do, uh, do this by calculating the intersection point of array of the line and the plane that is defined by this triangle. And then if we represent a triangle in so-called barycentric coordinates, we, there are easy conditions that we have to check that we can check to verify if the point is in the, within the triangle or not. And uh, now, of course, with ray tracing, the nice thing was that it came together. If we use, if we represent the plane as a parametric equation as well, and then equal it to the ray equation, we get a linear equation system. And the nice thing about that was, if we choose the plane equation in a way that is in a very in a specific way, namely that we have the support vector is one of the vertices of tri our triangle, and then the other two vectors are pointing away from it. So we take b minus a and c minus a. So for, of, obviously for a plane, we can take all vectors that are not linearly dependent that are on the plane surface. But for the, if we choose these two, then the plane equation is the same as the representation of this 2D subspace in barycentric coordinates. And then when we use the linear equation system to, to calculate the intersection point, 
we do not only get the parameter t that allows us to calculate this intersection point, but we also get the parameters beta and gamma that we can use for che uh, checking this condition of the barycentric coordinates if the point is within the triangle. So this was a very nice way, and I think that was the part where uh, 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 someone com complained that I went too much, too fast over it because there were so many uh, equations there and I quickly went over them and you didn't have time to, to look into them. But there were really the, the basic uh, equations that we already had and I also uh, often realized that if I'm repeating stuff then uh, uh, always the, the noise level sometimes goes up um, and also in the evaluations a lot of people are always complaining that I'm repeating too much um, but of course uh, there is so much material in this course that I think also every now and then repeating stuff like I'm doing right now is also a good idea. Good. And then, of course, we talked about the shading model. Or we didn't talk about the shading model because the shading model that we use for ray tracing, the very simple initial shading model, that is, uh, of course, the same that we already used for the rendering with the perspective projection methods. <coughs> What we talked about then is, of course, these extensions of this shading model, and we saw that there are two way, two extensions. The one is the shadow feelers, and the other is the specular reflection, that are actually quite simple extensions because they fit very nicely in this overall framework of ray tracing. So for the ray, uh, shadow feelers, we're just shooting shadow. Uh, rays not, instead of from the eye, we're shooting them from a specific position on an object towards the light to see and to check if there is uh, a direct way or direct connection to the light source and if there is of course then it's in the light and if not if an object blocks the direct view to the light then of course we are in the shadow. And the only special thing we have to take care of is of course that when we are shooting a ray from an object we might get inaccuracies or small inaccuracies that we do of course not have when we're shooting a ray from the eye because then we're looking from t for the values t larger than one so we have a distance from our eye but when we are shooting it directly from the object these small inaccuracies in the calculation can cause of course uh, a situation that uh, we get the false result that the ray already intersects with the objects from which we are shooting from so the object would cast a shadow to itself which of course doesn't make sense. One new thing that we did that we haven't covered before was this uh, refraction where we have a situation that we have a ray coming into a transparent object like a piece of glass or also if we have water then the, we know from physics that the light is reflected differently from water so if you're diving and you look up the perspective looks of course differently than if you're looking from the outside into the water and uh, this uh, refraction of these vectors where the vector is then of course uh, refracted at a certain angle is something that was new but we saw that we can calculate them, calculate it with very easy and simple arithmetic transformations. So we use trigonometric functions for that to calculate this refracted vectors. Of course, as I said now, we used very simple arithmetic transformations. The, ar the transformations themselves didn't really look very simple, especially the result looked much more complicated that the, than the beginning, but the clue was that in the end we transformed it in a way that we could calculate it very easily with just uh, simple arithmetic calculations and we didn't need any, for example, trigonometric functions in the end to represent it or any angles to represent it, but we just had uh, plus minus and uh, uh, times operations there. Good. And then we moved on and said, okay, uh, now let's look a little bit more into the modeling, uh, because especially the first approach was also something that nicely uh, relates to what we've done before, which was this transformation of objects, where we said we can create new objects by multiplying them with a transformation matrix. And that can, of course, be used also in modeling. So you probably remember I had this uh, example with this flying saucers where we took a circle and made an ellipse to it. And then we get this uh, UFIO. And then uh, we can use that and uh, transform that further. We can rotate it and scale it. And um, <clears throat> the nice thing about this is, of course, because it's a linear transformation, it preserves the relative distances also of intersection points. So if we want to calculate the intersection point of this more complicated uh, 3D object, then we can retransform it into the original object, also retransform the original the ray into the uh, uh, corresponding ray 
that intersects then with the original object, do the easier calculation for the intersection points, and then transform it backwards. So this was a nice application of this uh, translation matrices that we had in the first uh, part that uh, we can use here in ray tracing to not only create different objects, but also to calculate the intersection points quite easily. And the final approach that we uh, talked about was then a little bit different than what we've done before because it used set theory and not linear algebra. And that was the idea to use set operations also to create new objects. So for example, if I have the intersection of two objects and then remove the intersection, or make a difference, or if I create the intersection, I can create very different, uh, more complex geometric shapes. And the clue about this is if we look into the uh, intersection of array with these objects, also in terms of not intersection points, but in terms of all the intervals that are, inter uh, of all the point clouds that are, uh, the point sets that are intersecting, we can represent them as intervals, and then the intersection points are just the border of the intervals that result from the same set operations. Good. And uh, so now we're moving to the, to the last point, which is the uh, faster ray tracing. Of course, we said at the beginning that ray tracing is very slow. And the major reason for that is, of course, because we have to do all these intersection tests. And um, so this is, if you look into faster ray tracing approaches, the first, uh, first area to optimize is, of course, always this uh, this um, <coughs> intersection with the objects, how we can speed that up. So let's look into a few approaches to do that. And um, these are, you see it here, where am I here? You see it here in the book. It, this is in the book, it's in the chapter spatial data structures because this is not only relevant for ray tracing, of course, it is obviously ray tracing is the major area where you want to apply this, but these ray intersection tests are also important, for example, for culling. You remember when we had this situation for the perspective projection, we had a few frustum, and then we had to say, okay, we, we said, okay, if an object is completely outside, we can remove it, and if it is intersecting with the borders of the few frustum, we have to do some clipping and cut this part off here. So uh, this is also where it's used, but I also already said that it's also used for collision detection. So for example, if you have an interactive game and you click somewhere on the screen, then you want to know, of course, at which object you're clicking. So you can shoot a ray towards the scene then at that particular pixel. And then the first object that is hit by this ray is, of course, the one that the user wants to click at. I think in the book they call this picking. <coughs> Good. And uh, yeah, so we want to optimize this and there are basically two major uh, categories of approaches. One is based on partitioning the objects and the other is based on partitioning the space. So let's look into object partitioning first because that's also related to something that we have done before which is uh, bounding boxes. So remember we used bounding boxes or bounding volumes we used in relation to uh, culling where we used spheres to uh, co to cover or contain a whole 3D object. And we use spheres because for the spheres, the intersect the test, if, a sphere, if it is inside or outside of the few first and was quite easy. We use bounding boxes in relation to rasterization, where we said if we have a triangle, instead of checking all the pixels on the screen, we can just check the pixels of the bounding box of the triangle. And um, of course, we can also do the same, or the, the same idea applies to ray tracing when we do ray intersection, ray object intersection tests. Instead of checking very complex objects with, if they intersect with the ray, we can just first do a check if the bounding box intersects with the ray, and then we do an object, we check the object. That might result, of course, in situations like this, where we do an unnecessarily test here if it intersects, and then we still test this year, so we have more tests here, but here we are eliminating a lot of tests because all these objects here are not intersecting with the ray, so only these two boxes are intersecting, so we only, so overall we reduce the number of tests significantly. And of course I hope you also remember that we uh, 
said that we can calculate these bounding boxes very easily by just taking the minimum and the maximum x and y values and creating then the vertices of this bounding box. So for example, the lower left border is defined by x min and y min. And then if we take the maximum, which is this one here, the, the y maximum is here, and the uh, x maximum is of course here, then we get the upper right border here, and this is then the border of our bounding box if we have a bounding box with axis parallel uh, sides. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> and then we have to check if, the, uh, if it intersects with the ray, and we don't have to calculate the intersection points, we're just interested in does it intersect with it or not, because if it intersects, then we want the intersection points with the objects within, not with the bounding box, of course. So we just need to calculate if it intersects. And uh, the question is, of course, how can we do this efficiently? Of course, we represent the, the ray with a line equation. Of course, the most obvious one should be probably the parametric equation. So we have an I vector, we have a direction vector. And then the first thing we're doing is to calculate the intersection points with this box. If we want to do it in an efficient way, we check it against all the borders that make up this bounding box. So I only have the 2D example here because that's easier to illustrate. Of course, in 3D, we don't have a bounding box with a line. We have a bounding box with, um, with a plane as a side border. And instead of four, we have, uh, of course, six, bo uh, six bo uh, borders. But um, you get the idea also from the 2D case. In a 2D case, of course, for example, the left side is the plane, e uh, the line equation x equals x min. x min is then the minimum value of the bounding box that we have here specified. And then, of course, for all the points, no matter what the y value is, if the x value is x min, it is on the line. So this is the, the line that we need to do uh, an intersection test if it intersects with the ray. And we do that, of course, by taking, we can do that by taking here the first line from the line equation, uh, from the ray, yeah, from the right line equation, and then equalizing it with this line equation that represents the left side of the, of the bounding box. And then if we transform this, we solve this for t, we get our t value for the intersection point. And we could put that into the line equation here then, in the ray equation here then, to actually calculate that intersection point. But like I said, we do not want or not need this intersection point. We just need to know, does it intersect with the bounding box or not? And of course, if we just check this one, it could also intersect here. So just that we have an intersection point doesn't mean uh, it intersects with the bounding box. So we also have to check, of course, all the other borders here. And uh, uh, be careful here for simplicity. I'm assuming that we're always shooting the ray in this direction here. So this case here, this case here, and this case here are excluded for now, just to make the illustration easier because the other cases are just similar. We just need to replace then the y x min and x max and y min and y max in an appropriate way, but it's just symmetric to the other one, to the to the other case. Of course, like if we have it here, then of course the first one we hit is not the min, the the y min, this it's the y max, so that's why it changes symmetrically. But that's also why I exclude it here because it just makes it more complicated instead of four you have then uh, multiple lines of, uh, of equations here. It just makes it more confusing, but it's the same principle. So we're we are assuming we're looking into the positive uh, uh, way or the direction vector points only in the positive uh, square uh, part here. And then we can calculate the, the T values for the intersection in the following, in this way here. And now the question is, of course, how do we check if it intersects with the bounding box? And the idea is to do this efficiently, is to look at the interval from x min to x max, that's this one here, and to look into that interval. So does anyone have an idea on how that helps us, or why that helps us, or what technique we're using here? We had it last time, and I also repeated it this time. Intersection, when we move to intervals, it's exactly this uh, constructive solid uh, uh, geometry that we're using. So you remember when we have two objects and we see them as solid objects, 
and we look into the intervals that are intersecting, then if we apply the same operations that we apply to the intersection of the objects to create a new object, if we apply the same operations to the intersection intervals, the resulting intervals, the borders of the resulting intervals, give us exactly our intersection points here. And this is basically what we apply here. I usually first called it uh, S for stripe, but now uh, then I realized that I only have an S for square, so I called it R for ribbon. So you see here what we're doing by looking into these uh, planes, these bordering planes of the of the of the bounding box. We're basically looking at this stripe here and this stripe here, and then we're calculating the intersection with these stripes here as intervals and then we apply the same operation to this intersection here to get the intersection if we are interested in these intersection points. That's not what we are, we are just inter interested in do they intersect and that is of course it intersects with the, the combination of the two by, uh, in a case where we have where these two uh, intervals also intersect. So if we think about what, if we're just in this positive area here, then the only way that it does not intersect with the bounding box is that the ray shoots to the left of it or shoots up. Should have drawn it from here. Ah, oh, it's not that easy to draw here. Shoots in that direction. And then we see, of course, if these are the intervals that we are checking, we see that if x min is larger than y max, then of course those intervals do not overlap. And here we have just have the opposite case. Here we have t y min is larger. t y min is this one here, the interval that starts here, is larger than x max, which is the interval that stops here. And then of course we have the situation here that those don't inter overlap, so the ray shoots to the right of the bounding box, and only when it's when these conditions are not fulfilled, then it's inside because only then the two intervals overlap. So you see this is a nice uh, application of this approach that we used for this uh, creation of new objects also to verify if the ray intersects with the bounding box. And of course, but uh, be careful, yeah, we only looked into the positive cases also. We didn't say that yet. Uh, if you have a situation that you have a ray shooting in that direction, or in that direction, so if you have an infinite or a zero uh, slope of your ray, then of course uh, you have to, you will end up getting a division by zero in these equations here, so you have to be careful to treat these special cases uh, separately. But they are, like I said, just uh, symmetric cases with the others, so it's uh, uh, why I'm skipping them here, but I think it's a good exercise for yourself to do it at home. Good. Now, of course, um, we already said when we had this, this vol culling volumes that, uh, or the bounding volumes in relation to the culling that we do not necessarily just need a box. We can also, for example, use a sphere and it's, or we can use any kind of uh, shape and we can use, of course, any kind of shape covering any kinds of objects. So it doesn't just have to cover one object. So for example, if we have a few objects that are very close to each other, it could also make sense to make a larger bounding box around all those objects. So it's illustrated here in this example here where we have these blue objects. And then instead of just taking, checking the red bounding boxes, we group them hierarchically. So we say we combine certain objects into another bounding box, which is then the green level. And then we say, okay, we make a final bounding box that goes around all those objects. And then of course we can make a hierarchical check. So we first check, does the ray intersect with the yellow bounding box? If it doesn't, there is no point in checking all the objects within there. If it does, then we check the green bounding boxes. If it intersects with one of with some of them, then we check them uh, further. If it doesn't, then we don't have to check the objects within there. So the idea, the uh, principle, uh, the, uh, the the principal idea of that should be very, uh, very uh, simple and easy to understand. The question is, of course, how can we implement this efficiently? And here we often represent these hierarchical structures in a tree structure. So we say the nodes of the tree represent the bounding boxes and the leaves are then the objects that are in the bounding box and the top of the tree is of course our 
major bounding box that contains all the other bounding boxes. So what we do when we have a ray here, we first check does the ray intersect with the yellow bounding box, so which the top node of the tree, with the root of the tree. If it does intersect, then we have to check all the bounding boxes within. That means we have to check all the subtrees in this tree here if they intersect. And we see here, if this, this here is the first one, this one doesn't intersect here, so we can cut this part of the tree off. We don't have to check that because we know it doesn't hit the green bounding box, so it will not hit all the objects within there. But it hits the other two, object, two bounding boxes, so we have to check these here, so we have to go down the tree in this direction and check the red bounding boxes that are in there. Now we see here it doesn't intersect with these two, so we don't have to do a check with these objects. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, it's correct. We don't have to do a check with these objects here, but we have an intersection with this one, so we have to check this object for an intersection. Same here, it doesn't intersect with this one, but it intersects with this one, so we have to check this one here for an intersection and then we see it doesn't intersect with this one so this is a false positive and it, here it intersects with that so a false positive we call situations like this a false positive when we have an intersection with a bounding box that suggests an intersection so we have a positive result that it is intersects but it turns out later to be a negative result because the actual object within there does not intersect, so we make an unnecessary test, but overall it saves us a lot of uh, additional tests that we can exclude per default. Yeah, so you see it's, uh, it's, oh, it's just the example to verify if I was correct. Yeah, yeah. so you see uh, the basic principle is very simple, but of course the question is how do we create this hierarchy of bounding boxes? And that is, of course, a, not an easy a, a question to answer. So that depends, of course, on the scene. It's uh, not straightforward how to do a nice uh, separation into bounding boxes, because we can also go in the other direction that instead of combining different objects into one bounding box, we can, of course, say we have, we have a complex object. Like you remember also for the triangles, we had this situation that we had this extreme case that I used to motivate a different approach. We have a triangle like this, and then of course we end up having a huge amount of space that will cre create a huge amount of false positives. And that, in that case, it would make sense to map the uh, several to match several bounding boxes onto one object. Good. So you see here, this is uh, uh, the basic principle of this is quite simple, but the, the actual implementation of it, of course, leads to a lot of uh, uh, small questions. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> this is uh, the, the second approach that I already mentioned is then based not on the object partitioning, but on the space partitioning, where we kind of at least initially uh, make a more straightforward approach that we say we do not try to to model the objects in the best way with bounding boxes, but we just put a regular grid onto them in this way. And then we say, okay, we check if the array intersects with the grid cells, and then we check the objects or the parts of the objects that are within the grid cells. So compared to the, uh, uh, to the object partitioning, where we say we divide our space based on the objects, and we can also, of course, group the objects. So for another tree, those subtrees do not necessarily can, of course, overlap in case we have overlapping bounding boxes. But as long as the hierarchy is preserved in a way that if an object intersects with a box, then it only con uh, it no, if an object is in the box, it must intersect with the higher level bounding box. That is, of course, not a problem. So we see we can divide the space here, but uh, in the space partitioning uh, approach, we go the opposite way, we divide the space, and then of course we have the situation that the objects might be contained in different boxes or cells, it's probably better to call them in this context. Um, but we have a regular distribution of the space, which makes some of the calculation also easier. And of course, the, the most straightforward way to do this is what's called to a uh, uniform spatial subdivision to just put a uniform grid over the space. 
like uh, I did in this uh, motivating example. So we just take a regular uh, uh, um, grid, put it over our scene, and then calculate the intersection of the ray with the cells. If it intersects with the cell, we do a check if it intersects with the objects that are in the cell. Um, and like I said, the advantage of this, or one of the advantages of this, is that the calculation of this is actually quite easy, especially when we, the, the traversal of this grid, because we can just we start with the ray in a specific cell, and then we have this intersection point, and then we want to know, let's, if we assume, of course, that again, that we go only in this positive way, that the ray moves up, then there are only two options for the next cell. It's either this one or that one. Otherwise, of course, it would be negative. So we have to check the x value goes what is plus one, but the y value can then be the same or the y value plus one. So we, <coughs> uh, the, the, not the y value, the, the i and j index, here it increases by one, here it can go up. So, uh, <coughs> of course, we also have this case, of course, in which case then the j value increases by one and the i value stays the same. So we have, what we do is we calculate the uh, intersections with the borders of this new candidates for cells, and then we compare it with the last one, and the one that is the closest to it is, of course, then the one where we have to go next. Wait, this is the actual the cell we are starting it. That was wrong. Good. All right. So you see, this is a very uh, uh, easy way to, to do that, to implement this. There is only one uh, thing we have to be careful with, because now we have the situation that the objects can intersect with multiple cells or can span over multiple cells. If we are in this cell here, and then we see, OK, this object is at least partly within this cell, and then we do an intersection test, and then we get a point at an intersection point, so we see the ray intersects with that object. This is the first cell to pass, and then we say, okay, now we stop here, because that must be the first object that is hit by the ray, because it is in the cell, and it has an intersection with the ray. And then we stop. Then, of course, we will never reach that cell, and we will never get this intersection point here, which is, of course, in front of this one. So we could solve this, of course, by splitting the object and creating two objects out of it, but that would, of course, be uh, computationally quite uh, uh, comp quite expensive. It is, of course, easier and uh, simpler to just check it with the original object and then check if the intersection point is indeed within the cell. And then, uh, we, if it's not, of course, we ignore it. And if it is, then, of course, if it is here, then we can report it. So you see, it's uh, quite simple. It's just a special case we have to take care of. The other question is, of course, I mean, we traded that uh, compared to the bounding boxes. We traded the question of what is the appropriate bounding box shape or size to map all our object to match all our objects. We traded that to what is the perfect grid size, and not only what is the perfect grid size, but also we're using here this uniform distribution of a grid, which might, of course, not really make sense. For example, if you have a situation where you have a lot of objects here and a lot of objects here, and then you make a unified grid over it, of course, you end up doing a lot of intersection tests here in the middle when you have a ray here. It would be much more efficient if you have a bounding box around these two groups of objects, or it would be much more efficient if you have a grid like this, and then you can often have here a further distinction of the grid. So if you have a non-uniform grid, and that is, of course, uh, one of the ways to optimize this, and one of the most popular approaches is the so-called oct trees or quad trees. Uh, Quad trees are the 2D version, arc trees are the 3D version. Again, I'm, sim uh, I'm restricting myself to the 2D version here because it is easier to illustrate. The generalization to 3D is straightforward. It's just moving from lines to planes. And uh, also to make the illustration of the basic principle simpler, I just drew dots here instead of really objects, but think of it as triangles or more complex 3D objects. 
And this is actually, uh, I think, one of the most used techniques in ray tracing that is also used in interactive uh, uh, games or in, in projective methods for interactive games when you do this uh, interaction sets for, for picking that oak trees are very, very commonly used. Good, so what is the idea of it? So the, uh, the, the, the major goal that we want to have here is to have more a grid distribution that resembles more the distrib uh, no, a grid size of the cells that matches more the distribution of the objects in our space. And in, so instead of a uniform grid, we want to have a grid that has different sizes of cells. So what we do is we start with the largest bounding box. We just have one cell that contains all the objects. And then we say we want to split that now in a way that we have smaller cells that contain a certain number of objects. In the most extreme case, we say we have grid, grid cells where we only have one object. If we have a very large scene with a lot of objects, of course, we will cut it down to, I don't know, 5, 10 or 100 objects. In this case, I'm using, uh, just to illustrate the example, I mean, I'm always using very simple examples here to illustrate the basic principle. I say we just uh, want to have grid cells with a maximum of two objects in each grid cell. So we start with the largest grid cell that contains all the objects, which is uh, the largest bound, uh, the, the bounding box that contains all the objects. And then we do a first split because we say, okay, there are too many objects in that bounding box. So we split it into four cells. And then we see, of course, already here, there is only one point here. So if we would make a further split here and then another split, we would only increase the number of intersection tests that we have to do here before we reach that one. So there is actually no point in doing a further split here because it would only increase our intersection tests. If we are within that cells, it makes more sense to directly check the object, which means we're not splitting that, but we're splitting all the others because they contain more objects than our, uh, our goal of just having grid size with just two objects. And then we see, of course, we have already then much more object cells where we only have a very small number of objects, so we don't need to further split them, but all the others contain more, so we split them again. And then we see our condition is fulfilled. Each cell has only maximum two objects, and we see that the grid distribution, much uh, the grid cell size now, much better matches the distribution of the points or of the objects in our space. And again, when we do the traversal, we can do that again by just checking the ray against the borders of the next bounding box. So from here to here, we check these borders here and compare it to the previous one. Of course, this uh, checking of the borders is a little more complicated now because we can have situations where we move from bounding boxes to uh, from cells from one size to cells with a different size. So it is a little more complicated, but it comes at the benefit of having to do less intersection tests in most cases because we have a better match to the object distribution. Good. Um, yeah. So that improves our situation a little bit, but of course we still have some sort of a uniform distribution by having all these square-shaped cells. And so, for example, if we have a situation like this here and that here, then it would make more sense to have those cells combined. Or if we have something like this, something like that, then, of course, we would like to have a grid size, maybe something like this here, that resembles this distribution in a better way. And with this one, we would still end up doing a lot of unnecessary tests or having a lot of uh, splits into cells that are unnecessary. Um, and this is then the uh, the extension of it, which is called the binary space partitioning trees, which is um, just looking at the at the time. Um, I don't really have that much content left, which is why I would kind of propose that I'm skipping the break today and continue and then close. Uh, much earlier than usual. Are you fine with that? Yeah, good. That also gives you more time for the practicals. Then I, I told the TAs that I might finish earlier today. 
uh, so they might already be there. I don't know if they got the email in time, but uh, yeah. Good, all right. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we want to split our space into uh, uh, into a way that is matches this situation better. Of course, we have the same situation here as with the uh, bounding boxes that I, uh, I think in relation to culling, I said it that if we take the bounding boxes, the more the bounding boxes map the actual shape of an object, the less unnecessary tests we have because the number of false positives, of course, decreases. But of course, the more the bounding boxes map the shape of the object, the more complex the intersection tests become. So we have a trade-off here, which is also the trade-off that we have here. So in, case, in this case, for example, it would make sense to have uh, uh, a tilted cell size. But of course, calculating this is much more difficult than calculating cells that are axis parallel, which is why this binary space partition tree approach uh, restricts itself to axis parallel splits. But we do not split uniformly like we did with the oct trees, but we split them um, in a way that resembles more, that creates this more different shapes uh, of, the, of the cells that are not necessarily uh, quadratic. So <clears throat> the idea is we start with the, with, the, with the objects and then we split them into cells in, in a first step into two cells of objects that have about uh, the same size, uh, no, uh, that contain numbers with, uh, of objects about the same, that contain about the same number of objects. So. Yeah, the noise level is uh, higher here, so uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's what I'm saying. Sometimes I'm speeding ahead because a lot of people are talking here, and I assume you're already you're, you're starting to get bored. But uh, anyway, so um, yeah, so we split it into almost equal sizes and almost equal. Of course, in this case, it works. We have nine objects on each side, but we have to say more or less equal size because, of course, if we have an uneven number, then one side definitely has one object more. Also, because we're doing an axis parallel split, there might be situations where we have, for example, something like this. And then if we want to make an axis parallel split, we cannot really split it very well. So in that case, we would do the split rather here. Um, in the worst case, of course, they are all on, on one line, but of course, that's a case that rarely happens. Uh, but it will, there will be, there can be situations where we cannot do an equal slip split. But the idea is basically to have it as equally split as possible. So we have two cells, and then again, we look into, we say, we want to have a, a situation where we only have a certain number of objects within one cell. So we now say, now we're creating a further separation into cells, which we now do horizontally, so we count on the left and on the right side the cells again, and then we split them. So you see here we have five, here we have four, here we have four, here we have five. And you see here, this splitting line is at a different level here. If we would make them at the same level, we would never get the same distribution of objects in the cells or the almost same distribution of objects in the cells. And then of course we're alternating again to a vertical split so we split them again here, and now we see we have the first cells where we have our criteria fulfilled, but we still have a couple of cells where we have more than two objects, so we split them again, now horizontally, and now you see all the cells have maximum two cells, and this uh, structure of cells now much better represents the distribution of the cells. It's probably not really such a nice example to illustrate the power or the advantage of that approach, but in the tutorial you have other cases, and I think it's also one, actually one exercise to think about cases where uh, this approach works better than the other and uh, vice versa. Good. So the basic idea, the basic principle of this separation is, of course, very simple, but of course, since we do not have these uh, uh, similar shapes of cells now, the traversal seems a little more complicated, at least if we do it in a way as we did it with the uniform sp uh, uh, spatial distribution, um, <coughs> uh, the uniform subdivision. But here it comes, of course, into play that uh, what I kind of ignored so far that we're talking about base partition, base binary space partitioning trees. We can, of course, represent this space in a tree structure. 
and then the traversal becomes quite easy. It's quite similar to these hierarchical bounding boxes. So if you remember, we did the first split with this line, so that becomes our root here. And then we split to the left and to the right with these blue lines here. So these are the subtrees of the first line. And then we split the green with the green lines, so we have another split here. And then for the, uh, another level here in our tree. And then we see, of course, here we already stopped because we already just had two objects in here. So these, there are no further splits here to the left of C1. So we just write the objects into become the leaves of our tree. I just wrote down the first five here to make the, the image less confusing. But you get the idea, these at the leaves, we all have the objects here. And at the nodes, we have all the splitting lines arranged. Now, and then we do, when we do the traversal, of course, the traversal we can do then along the tree, similar to what, how we did it with the uh, hierarchical space partitioning. We start with the ray here, and we check it first against the node. So we see it's to the right of the splitting line, and it does not intersect with the splitting line, which means, of course, that this part of the ray will never intersect with any object that is on the left side of the splitting line. So we don't need to look into that part of the tree. We can ignore that completely. Then we check, we go down the next level, and then we check against this splitting line. We see it intersects with it, so it is to both sides, so it can potentially intersect with cells that are on both sides of this splitting line. So we have to follow both subtrees from B, and then from B2, and then we see it intersects with C3, and it intersects, or intersects of course here, with uh, C3 and C4. So we have to check both of them. And then if we store them in a way that we always do, the, if the ray comes down from here, and we always store them that we have the top at the left and the bottom at the right, or the left, if we do a, a vertical split, the left at the left side on the left, and the right side on the right in our tree, we can go from the left to the right. And then we check the first cell here. And then we see, OK, it does not intersect with it. We also see it doesn't intersect with this one. So we don't No, For the first cell, we see it intersects with the cell. So we have to check these two objects that are here. But we see it, they don't intersect with it. Here we see it doesn't intersect with the cell, so we don't even have to test those objects. But for C4, we see it intersects with both cells here, so we have to go down the tree. It intersects with both, so we have to again check it. It does not intersect with this object in the first cell here, so we can ignore that. Uh, we, 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 uh, we have to check it, but we see that it doesn't intersect, so this was a false positive. And then we find the first one here. Of course, the first one does not intersect, this one here, but this one does intersect. And then we have found our first object, and because we know that this is to the right, we don't even have to look into that. We know that this is the first object that intersects. And of course, because we have made the splits based, in this case, uh, we're considering the objects, of course, then also this situation does not happen because we would place the splitting line at this side, of course. Good, so you see here, this is the final uh, tree with the tests that we had to make. We, uh, we saved a lot of intersection tests here, although, of course, this was a very simplified example to illustrate the basic principle. Good. Yeah, so this concludes now the, uh, the uh, faster ray tracing part and therefore also the ray tracing, the advanced ray tracing part. Are there any questions about the ray tracing? No? Because then I uh, come to the uh, concluding remarks. So just a little, uh, some final comments. Um, yeah, so this is basically just a, a summary of what we did. So uh, like I said at the very beginning, this is a course that is very work intensive because it covers a lot of material. So this approach of uh, combining or teaching the mathematics as part of an applied uh, area, apply application domain has certain advantages, but it has of course also the disadvantage that we have to pack a lot of material into one course. But you see also that a lot of the stuff that we did in the second part was very much building on the first part. So if you understood and learned the first part, then a lot of the, the stuff for the second exam should be quite easy. 
also for the people as a kind of an encouragement for the exam. Uh, if you didn't do very well for the first exam, there is still hope, of course, because uh, in the second part, you saw there were also a lot more algorithms than in the first one that you can learn and to understand, even if you didn't uh, uh, understand all the basic mathematics. So in general, people are doing a little better in the second exam if they prepare appropriately. Good. Yeah. So the question is now, of course, what is next? And of course, uh, what better way to close a course on computer graphics by showing a nice computer graphic? So last week when I was looking for this clip from the, the Pixar movie, I found another clip which I thought is quite nice here as a closing. So... Good, yeah. So uh, I hope you are not scared. I hope I did not scare you, but I hope I inspired you for computer graphics. So um, just a, a few words about, so yeah, like I said last time, I, uh, I mean, the course only covered the very basics. So what, if you look at these uh, Pixar movies, um, I, I, uh, what, what I hope is that, yeah, when you look at these kind of things and you see that, of course, they are using much more advanced techniques than we covered, but if you see, if you look at it, I hope that at some point you also start and seeing, uh, thinking about how they might have done this, and you see this and you say, well, this actually looks a little bit like the God race that we implemented for the practicals, even if they might have used a different technique. Um, and also, of course, um, I, I put here the, the link to this uh, Pixar page that I mentioned last time where they published their papers. If you look at those papers for the people who are interested in getting a deeper understanding or learning more about it, uh, of course, for most of you, if you don't have a mathematical background already, this will be way too advanced and overwhelming. But I hope that at least the course taught you enough about the basic principles and also the terminology of computer graphics that if you read these articles or look into them that you get a basic understanding or an idea about what they are doing and what kind of uh, techniques they are doing even if you're not understanding each uh, uh, calculation of it and each formula of it. Um, I, uh, I also found a nice, uh, just this weekend there was an interesting article on The Verge about uh, the lighting that they do in this new Pixar movie, which was a more uh, a journal article, uh, a, a magazine article, so it's not really a scientific article, but it's kind of uh, a nice way to, to look into it also in relation to, to the course, because they are uh, uh, saying a little bit that they're looking more into ray tracing now to make the global illumination better. Good, another uh, com uh, link I want to give you um, because someone already asked me, or some people asked me about uh, projects in relation to computer graphics, research projects, uh, especially the master's students, but I think also for the bachelor, they can do, a, I think you can do a capita selecta, depending on what you're studying. Um, and of course, we already give you a lot of links into uh, practice, in the practicals about programming of graphics, but uh, we are, uh, I also want to give you some links about researching graphics. So what, what, are, what is currently done in, if you say you do research in computer graphics, what are people doing? And a good source for that is, of course, the SIGGRAPH. Uh, Server SIGGRAPH is one of the big uh, special interest group of the ACM. ACM is the Compu an American Computer Association where uh, they are organized in certain special interest groups of different topics. And one of them, one of the biggest, is, of course, computer graphics. And they have this web server and they also have an annual conference where they always show new and uh, latest research results, which are quite interesting to look at also if you're uh, looking for inspiration for your own projects. Um, unfortunately, if you are interested in computer graphics projects, we do not have people here who are actually doing rendering based computer graphics. There are a lot of people who are doing work like me who is that is a little related to computer graphics, but no explicit rendering. We are, however, in the process of hiring someone, a professor in computer graphics, but uh, I'm not sure about the status, so it might take a while. So for now, if you're interested in projects about computer graphics, you basically just have to walk around and ask uh, a variety of people who are doing projects that are related to computer graphics. Um, but yeah, in the future, it will, might get easier. Yeah, and of course, those people who are those people, you can look at this by uh, looking into the related courses. 
yeah, so this is like an, an outlook of what, uh, what you can do if you're interested in computer graphics or what you should probably avoid if you're not interested in computer graphics. What you should definitely avoid if you didn't like this course is failing the exam because then you have to do it again. Um, and if you pass it, of course, then uh, the, uh, the first one, Optimalization and Complexity, I just put it there because the computer graphics course is listed as a mandatory requirement for that course. But I think it's just because of the mathematics that they use there because they use a lot of linear algebra, but it's not really related to computer graphics. What is mostly related to computer graphics are, of course, these two areas that I said at the very beginning are essential parts of computer graphics, which is modeling and animation that we did not cover in this course. So you see there are separate courses for that. The three-dimensional modeling is a bachelor course, but you can also take it as a master student. Computer animation then is a master course in a GMT master program. And of course, most importantly, we have the advanced graphics course in the master program now, which last year was taught by someone who was explicitly hired because we didn't have this professor yet for computer graphics. So the idea is that the new professor will then take over this course. So I'm not sure what will happen next year if the new professor is already here or if we again need to hire an external person, but the course will take place again next year. And uh, of course, I also said there are a lot of, uh, there is the opportunity to do experimentation process, master thesis or capita selecta if you're a bachelor student. But of course, yeah, you can do all these great things if you pass this course. So just some final comments on the course practicals. Uh, the TA session that I announced last time is confirmed now. So you find them also on the website. So we have additional sessions, take advantage of that. Be prepared that it will be very crowded on Thursday, so don't rely on uh, getting last-minute support. Um, that line is also clear. Uh, yeah, the random code checks, usually I do this, like, like last time, I select randomly a couple of groups from the people who submit, and they have to come then to the BBL and uh, meet with us, and uh, we just do a quick look at your code and uh, check if everyone in the group contributed to it. That's uh, because we cannot check everyone individually, we just decided at some point to do these random code checks to also scare you a little bit and uh, make sure that you are all contributing because you could, in theory, be picked. Usually I do this after the exam. The problem with the exam this year is from 5 to 8 o'clock, so uh, I don't want to force you to come at late at night till 9 o'clock to the BBL building, which is why we will do it before the exam. So, But the people who are selected there, if you don't like this date, we can arrange a different one. The problem is it's already done in the exam week, so I guess uh, it's very difficult to bring you in. Um, but yeah, we will see how this works. Um, I, when I was a student, I always hated if I have I had appointments directly before an exam, but we will see. Good, yeah, tutorials uh, I already said are today and Thursday. Lectures are the last one today, but of course, if you enjoyed it, you can always relive them by listening to the recordings. And uh, yeah, of course, yeah, the final exam, uh, I mean, yeah, I think you should all know that time. Yeah, I'm, I don't know why they put it so late this year. It's always with this course, we end up getting very weird time slots, but uh, this time we have a late one, which is annoying, but not as annoying as the one time we had a course, uh, an exam starting at 8.30. So <laughs> at least that is good. So it covers the last, second part, but of course you need all the, the knowledge that we need for these approaches in the second part from the first part as well. And the same conditions as with the midterm exam. I am not going to say much about the retake because I assume or I hope that this will not be relevant for most of you, it's more here to scare you because you see here this is, if you fail the course and you have to do the retake, it will ruin your summer, so make sure you're prepared and pass it in the first round. Good. Are there any questions? General questions, organization? Because if not, then that's about it. I hope you enjoyed the course and you do well in the exam and yeah, I see you in some other course then.